How's it going, bros and scowngs? Welcome to Geek Critique. My name is Dakota. Since its release last month, I've seen Avatar The Way of Water five times now. That may seem like a lot of time spent watching a film one can readily appreciate in just one sitting, but this movie has an emotional hold over me in a way I haven't experienced in a very long time. And every time I see it, I love it just a little bit more. So today I wanted to make a video about not only my appreciation for Avatar The Way of Water, but about how upon closer examination and study of the film, you'll discover its world building and themes are far more intricate than can be understood in one sitting. There are a number of small details you'll notice when you're not looking at what the camera is directing your eye to. There are reactions from characters that go unnoticed when you don't know their full story. And there are certain parallels that are just mind-blowingly awesome. So, if you're ready to learn about some cool, lesser-known details about Avatar The Way of Water, let me know by clicking that like button, subscribing to the channel, and commenting your thoughts about all we have to point out. This video is only intended for those who have already seen Avatar The Way of Water, as we touch on heavier character themes and motivations that will spoil the fun if you haven't seen it. You have been warned. I've seen the film in four different formats now, so if you've seen it already and are thinking about seeing it again, here's what I've discovered about each format. My first viewing was in Dolby Cinema 3D HFR, or high frame rate. The film experiments with a variable frame rate that speeds up the action sequences and underwater scenes to 48 frames per second, but slows back down to 24 FPS for other scenes. Whenever it slows down, it became jarring to look at, and while I noticed this in other HFR screenings, from my Dolby Cinema experience, it was the most noticeable. One thing worth taking into account with Dolby Cinema, though, is the audio setup is insane. So from an audible standpoint, Dolby comes out on top. My second and fourth viewings were with IMAX 3D HFR. These were my favorite modes to watch the film, partially because the screen was massive, but it simply was the smoothest to look at and the most engrossing experience overall. For my third viewing, I chose to do IMAX 3D without HFR. After two screenings in HFR, the standard 24 FPS was smooth and easy to enjoy, but it lost some of the energy you get with a higher frame rate. And finally, I saw it in standard 2D for my fifth viewing. I'm glad I did, because there's a high fidelity quality there that allows certain things in the background to be noticed more clearly than in 3D. But ultimately, the experience was far duller. It's the same film, sure, but it lacked the immersive quality that James Cameron intended for it. If you haven't seen it in 3D, I dare say you missed out on literally half of the fun. Now, what are you most likely to notice from each showing format upon a rewatch? In variable HFR, the experience is much smoother, until it isn't. The drop down to 24 FPS is jarring and questionable. In 3D, the immersion is unparalleled, until it isn't. Certain objects in the far distance don't translate properly to your glasses. Like when Neytiri and Jake are on their date in the beginning and they see the new star in the sky, you'll see the stars appear in double vision, never quite coming into focus in 3D. In 2D, the 4K fidelity is incredible, until it isn't. Very early on, you may notice some really shoddy background CGI, like certain humans that appear in Nateyam's naming ceremony look particularly rubbery. These are all exceptions to the rule for a film that looks and is incredible throughout, but it's something to keep an eye on the next time you watch it. When I released my Avatar video last month, which I didn't expect to perform even half as well as it did, one of the most consistent comments I received was that a certain aspect of the story or two didn't work because of X, Y, or Z. Having seen the film three times already by the time I released that video, my response was simply, trust me, just see it again, you'll appreciate it more the second time around. And I think this holds true for most of it. Much of the issues I had the first time through were smoothed out on a future viewing. There are plot holes, for sure, which I won't touch on in this video, but for the most part, the character choices people disagree with most make much more sense when you're looking at the character's entire personal arc. The biggest example of the audience misunderstanding or showing too little empathy for a character decision is undoubtedly Spider's saving of Quaritch at the end of the film. Which, yeah, I get it. It's a frustrating decision as an audience member who feels that the defeat and potential death of Quaritch was totally earned. But to fully understand Spider's decision, you have to take into consideration his unique relationship to the Sullys. 
He has, from a very young age, been tethered to the Solis, growing up around Jake and Neytiri's kids, always hoping to be accepted as one of them, but always being held at arm's length. While the film doesn't showcase Neytiri's disdain for Spider half as well as the comics do, we do see glimpses of Neytiri's cold nature towards the boy early on. When you rewatch it, keep an eye on their few interactions, and also note how scared Spider is of Neytiri whenever he witnesses her fighting or watches footage of her killing his father. She is the barrier to his true adoption into the Soli family, and because of that he can never truly find the belonging that he craves. That is, until he's shown some level of belonging with the avatar of Miles Quaritch. Despite witnessing Quaritch commit some truly terrible atrocities, Quaritch is willing to spare the life of Kitty to save Spider's life from Neytiri, a level of protection and belonging he has never experienced. Spider knew full well Neytiri wasn't bluffing and would have happily killed him to get her daughter back. Spider's subsequent decision to save Quaritch's life, while upsetting to watch, is the only real meaningful choice he had available to him. Quaritch, as evil as he is, was a parent figure that showed him some modicum of belonging. And while he doesn't respect Quaritch, Spider understands that he's still alive because of him. So it becomes a life for a life situation. Spider now sees that debt repaid, which is why he heads back to trying to scrape out a belonging with the Solis again. Only time and future sequels will tell how well that choice goes for him. Speaking of a life for a life, this film showcases other pretty blunt parallels you might appreciate more fully on repeat viewings. Like when Jake Sully takes Spider as his son, even saying, a son for a son, after the death of Nateyam. But there's another parallel you might not have thought of. Soon after Loak meets Pyakon, we see one of his fins has been cut off. Later in the film, upon Loak's Sahelu bonding with Pyakon, we see glimpses of the battle with the humans that dismembered him. Now this wasn't pointed out to me until after my fourth viewing, but when Pyakon attacks the whalers, what do we see he takes from the captain of the ship? Using the harpoon line, he rips off Mick Scoresby's arm, a significant bit of karmic justice. Just as Spider opted for a life for a life, and as Jake Sully opted for a son for a son, so too does Pyakon opt for an arm for an arm. While Scoresby likely wasn't the Tulkun hunter that ripped Pyakon's fin off, he was equally deserving of the repayment Pyakon was after. Now that I pointed this out, trust me, you can't unsee the significance of that transaction. While we're on the topic of Pyakon, we don't learn of his being an outcast until well into the course of the movie, and our introduction to this benevolent creature is through the point of view of the recently saved Loak, who becomes fast friends with the Tolkun. But upon coming back to this introduction of Pyakon on a rewatch of the film, his expressions make much more sense and are far more heartbreaking and meaningful. Pyakon is fully aware that the local Navi of the Metkayina and Taunui clans know him as a killer and treat him as an outcast, but that doesn't stop him from saving the life of Loak. Loak has no such knowledge of Pyakon, his outcast status, or the Tolkun way. Notice that early on in their first interaction, Pyakon brings Loak's attention to the hook in his fin. It's my interpretation, after watching this several times, that Pyakon wasn't necessarily asking for Loak to remove the device from his fin, but rather to give Loak a heads up that he is the outcast. Loak doesn't take the hint because he has no knowledge of Pyakon, and rather frees him of the restraints and claims to Pyakon that they are now friends. Pay close attention to the expression in Pyakon's eyes, one of disbelief, as this young Navi boy doesn't reject him as an outcast, but rather accepts him as a friend. It's heartbreaking to think that he has been all alone for some extended period of time, and this is the first time someone has called him a friend since. Pyakon then does this exuberant flip underwater in celebration of their newfound friendship. It's such a beautiful moment, one only truly appreciable with the full knowledge of a rewatch. Loak's character arc is perhaps my favorite of the film. His connection to Pyakon is a natural one because he believes himself to be an outcast and a disappointment to a family he can't live up to, namely a brother who he believes to be perfect and a father who once commanded 15 clans as the great Toruk Makto. One very prominent and physical attribute brought up throughout the film is that Loak has a fifth digit on his hand where natural Na'vi have only four. Kiri also has five fingers, prompting others to call her out as a freak. Their feet, too, boast five toes to the normal Navi four. 
but if you look closely, despite there being no scenes that explicitly highlight it, you'll notice neither the oldest son Nateyang or the youngest daughter Toktire have five digits on their hands or feet, but instead have the normal four like other Navi. While Tuk and Nateyam took their genes from Neytiri, Loak and Kiri appear to have taken their dominant genes from their respective Avatar parents. The fact that the film highlights this physical abnormality so often and doesn't highlight the fact that the other two children have normal Navi hands and feet speaks to there being scenes cut where it did matter. Scenes that made Loak and possibly Kiri feel like an even bigger outsider or freak among even their own family. It's my takeaway that a large portion of Nateyam's scenes were cut due to runtime in general, and I believe if we want to piece together more of his story, it may start with that huge physical disparity between him and his brother Loak. This video was originally going to be a list of 10 things you'll notice on a rewatch, but I decided to keep it short with just 5. After all, I've got another Avatar video coming soon, so I wanted to get this out in a timely manner. My next video will be all about what happened in the 15 years between Avatar 1 and 2, and after that, prepare for big MCU Phase 4 timeline breakdowns. These videos are made possible by our ever-growing list of Patreon members, who allow us to experiment with new topics that make the channel better and better with each new upload. I hope you all liked this video. If you did, please don't forget to click that thumbs up button on your way out, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Did we miss anything you think we should cover in a future video? Let me know in the comments below, and if you feel like we deserve it, subscribe to the channel for more videos like this. If you can't get enough of Avatar, you won't want to miss our new massive timeline on the history of Pandora. Thanks guys, have a good one.